Hello brothers and sisters, this is Minister David Bowen. Welcome to the Where Do We Go From Here broadcast. Let us have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. Father, we pray that you bless this broadcast and let it be a blessing to each and every listener, hearer, and viewer. We pray that uh, through this broadcast that lives be changed, that uh, broken hearts be mended, that uh, sicknesses be healed, and that lie and souls be saved. Lord, we give you all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Once again, welcome to the Where Do We Go From Here broadcast. For just a little while, I'd like to direct your attention to two verses of Scripture found in the, uh, in the book of Philippians, uh, the Apostle Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. Uh, Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14. Philippians 3, verses 14, 13 and 14. And it says, uh, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. In the regular King James Version, it's I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of Christ Jesus. But just uh, for a little while, just talk, like to talk about Pressing on in Christ Jesus. Pressing on in Christ Jesus. Uh, if you are saved and if you have accepted Christ as your Savior, then you realize that to move forward in Christ, there are, you will encounter opposition. You will encounter opposition. There are but in the midst of that opposition, we have to press on. Even the uh, prophet Isaiah let us know way back in the Old Testament, uh, some 800 years uh, perhaps before Christ uh, came on the scene in, in human form, uh, in the likeness of man, that he said that... Uh, no weapon that's formed against you shall prosper. But brothers and sisters, simply meaning that there would be weapons that would form, be formed against you. And for that reason, you would have to press on. And so, oftentimes, uh, we have to press. But it's important for us to know that... Uh, in doing so in the press, we need to be pressing on in Christ Jesus, pressing on in Him. And I'm not saying that uh, that uh, there will be a struggle. I'm not saying that it won't be struggle. Because any time that God calls us to do anything and He calls us to be a saved, He anoints us for that. But by the same token, uh, even the most anointed person that we have read about in the Bible, and Jesus' name as Messiah simply means the anointed one. Uh, the, uh, so Jesus would be the most anointed person that walked the earth. Uh, he encountered all kinds of opposition. And I just like the scripture that says uh, in Hebrew, but for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Simply meaning, even though all it for, for the joy that was to be uh, encountered after he finished, he pressed on even to the cross, which was an agonizing death. So when we encounter opposition, and which we will encounter opposition, it's important that we press on in Christ Jesus. As a matter of fact, there's a scripture in the Bible that says, no man that has put himself put his hand to the plow, simply meaning that uh, put his hand to the plow and, and then turn back is worthy of the kingdom, simply meaning that when you started to do a work and then you turn around and go back the other way, uh, you, uh, you negate uh, your, your worthiness 
to uh, to to come into the to the uh, presence of God. Turning around, you'll find that to be an offense to God all through the Bible. And I'll give you some examples in Genesis, uh, when God were to was pronounced had pronounced judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, and He saved Lot and his family, and He gave them one command was that they don't look back. That they don't look back. They didn't even talk about going back. But don't even look back. And we all know, I learned as a little boy, what happened to his wife when she looked back. Was that she turned into a pillar of salt. Now, if God was one of those kind of gods that, that, that uh, didn't think too much about that, or that didn't bother him too much, Perhaps she would have been able to look back and then continue the journey. But, because, uh, because God don't look at looking back in a favorable light, she turned into a pillar of salt. Plus, God is true to his word. There are, there are a lot of uh, commandments that God have given us, and then he's already given us the uh, punishment for those commandments that if we break them. But we feel like we live in a day and age now that we can do what we want. But uh, the scripture says in Numbers says, God is not a man that he should lie, or the son of man that he should repent. And if he said it, would he not do it? And if he spoke it, would he not bring it to pass? Now another place in the Bible where it says that, in Romans uh, chapter 3, where it says that God cannot lie. And then, uh, and then Hebrew said, "God, it's impossible for God to lie." So, brothers and sisters, if he, if he, if he don't look favorable on us turning around, looking back, that's not something that we should do. But we should press on. Simply meaning that when we press on, we are trusting in Him. We have put our faith in Him, even though things are not preferable at that particular moment in our eyesight. Yes, sir, brothers and sisters, we're talking about pressing on. And the Apostle Paul, he said in verse 13, he said, Brothers, I count myself to not have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. There are some things in our past that we often would desire to forget. But there are some things that perhaps brought us pleasure that we should forget even though we don't desire to forget them, and even we have stored them in a little corner of a space in our mind, or in our memory, that we can go back and visit it every now and then. But the Apostle Paul saw the seriousness of that and pressing on at the same time. So he says, uh, brethren, he's talking to the brothers, at, uh, brothers and sisters at the church of Philippi said, one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind me. Forgetting those things. Now, he wasn't necessarily talking about bad things all the time. But if you see earlier on in, uh, in the chapter, in chapter 3 of Philippians, at verse 4 he said, though I also might have a confidence in the flesh. Let me start uh, at verse 1. It says, uh, Finally, brethren, rejoice in the Lord for me to write the same thing to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. So beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of manipulation. For we are the circumcision. And he was talking about those people that was under the covenant of Abraham and by flesh. And uh, when you talk about the circumcision, those people uh, that were Jews by flesh uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the seed of Abraham. And uh, part of the covenant that God made with Abraham that circumcision were to be performed within an eight-day period. And uh, he says, uh, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. Simply meaning that we have a covenant uh, with God as well through Abraham but I was just through the spirit and how is that brother teacher because we are also descendants of Abraham 
by faith, those that have accepted Christ as the Savior. And he goes on to say, who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. And this is the part that I want to get to where I talk about uh, Abraham, about Paul in, his, in the flesh, his things, uh, his, uh, his memory was not always about bad things. But he said, though I might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more. He said, anybody that think that they got something to glory about, about in the past, and that they did outside of what Christ did, the accomplishment they made, I have even more. He goes on to say that circumcised the eighth day, simply meaning that he met all the requirements of the covenant. He was circumcised on the eighth day by his parents of the stock of Israel. Now Israel was known as God's chosen people, and that through them that the Messiah would come. And so he was part of that chosen people because he was, he was, he was part of the covenant. He, he had, uh, did, he was, through his parents, he had did things, the things were done for him to be part of the covenant. So he was of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. And Benjamin, you would think, uh, Benjamin, through that tribe came the very first king of Israel, which was Saul, King Saul, and a Hebrew of Hebrews. Now, if anybody else thought they were Hebrew, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. This is what Paul is saying concerning the law and a Pharisee. Not only that, he was a part of the Jewish council. Then concerning zeal, he said he had a zeal for persecuting the church concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. Now, when it came to uh, defending what they thought was the right way of living, he, he had a zeal for that. But let me read just a little further. But he said, but what things were a gain to me, those I have counted lost for Christ. Basically, what he's saying that all the accomplishments that he made before he accepted Christ as Savior, he counted he count them as lost. And he go on even further to say, I'll just read just a little bit more, verse 8, he said, Yet indeed I also count these things as lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. Jesus my Lord, whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish. Now if you read in the regular King James Version, this is the new King James Version, they use another word uh, which, which uh, describes something that is much more vile than rubbish. And he said that I may, and he counted all rubbish or something even more vile that he may gain Christ. Basically simply meaning that he hadn't come to Christ on his accomplishments. And though he had accomplished what we would consider a lot of great things in the world, he didn't count them as anything when he didn't count them as gain when it came to Christ. So brothers and sisters, what are you saying? I'm saying that once we accept Christ, uh, a lot of those uh, uh, degrees uh, 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 from uh, secular institutions and things like that, even though they are great accomplishments, what you have to do is evaluate how do they work for Christ and are they stand in between you and Christ. And if they are, then you have to forget those things which are behind you and uh, press toward, toward the mark of the higher calling. Yes, sir, brothers and sisters, I'm basically saying is that basically sometime, I'm not saying all the time, I'm not saying everybody, but sometime you can't go to Christ because of the uh, human accomplishments that you have. You can't full, get the full benefit of Christ. I'll give you an example when they talk about the rich young ruler that asked Jesus, what would it take to follow him? And Jesus told him to keep the commandments and this and that, to know the commandments. He said, well, I've kept all of them since I was a little boy. He said, go and sell what you have and give to the poor and then take up your cross and follow me. Well, brothers and sisters, uh, the fact that he had many possessions, 
those things stood between him and Christ. And it stood between him pressing toward the mark of the higher calling or the high calling. Yes, sir, brothers and sisters. So now what we would have to do is evaluate uh, what is it that would keep us from pressing toward that mark of the higher calling. And uh, there are some things that even us that are in Christ, we accept Christ as, uh, as our Savior, as our Messiah. And we realize it's only through Him that we can reach God. But there are some things of familiarity that we allow to get in the way. There are some things that we are familiar with that we haven't sacrificed, we haven't laid on the altar. And those things are keeping us from pressing on. They're they are holding us back, so to speak. And you can even find some churches where tradition will hold us back and will not allow us to, uh, to walk freely with Christ. Well, I can't do that because, uh, you know, we never did it before. We never did it before. You know, uh, sometimes we are not willing to move from that which are familiar. And that was a big problem that the Israelites had in the book of Exodus. After God had told Moses on the backside of the mountain to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. And in the desert, Moses had led uh, two to three thousand people, two to three million people from Egypt. Then when they got to the Red Sea, they started to complain right there. We told Moses that we'll leave us alone. We were good right there. We didn't want to get the Pharaoh all riled up. And uh, what are we going to do? And God gave him a solution. And told him to part the Red Sea. And he parted the Red Sea. And the children of Israel crossed on dry land. And then when the, uh, the, the Egyptian soldiers uh, proceeded to follow them, he let the water come along and wash them up. And if you can't see it in the Bible, if you can't get a, vis a visible illustration by reading it, you've seen the movie. And it washed them all up. And the, and the soldiers were washed up on the dry land, in the water, and when and even God had did that. And they got a little further and they ran out of water and they started to complain again. And they started to complain about, oh, if we was back in Egypt, all those onions and leeks and all that, 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 that stuff that we had, we wouldn't have to be worried about this. You have brought us out here to die. The problem was, brothers and sisters, uh, was that they were not willing to leave a place that was familiar to them and move on trusting in God. Whenever you press on in God, oftentimes it's going to have to be by faith. You won't be able to see where you're going. Now to talk about Abraham again, you'll see in uh, Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 through 3. And uh, let me go ahead and read that. Well, God... Uh, told Abraham to uh, get away from thy father's house. And this is the, uh, again, this is the new King James Version. He said, now the Lord said unto Abram, he hadn't changed his name to Abraham yet. He said, get out of thy country. This is a place of familiarity. And from your father's house, which was definitely a place of familiarity, to a land that I will show you. Well, he didn't say, get out, of your, get out of this country, get out of this land, and I want you to go out to California. But he said, to a place that I will show you. At that point, brothers and sisters, he was walking by faith. And you know what? He became known as the father of faith. And he said, but the Lord gave him some promises. And perhaps when God ever... Uh, command you to do something. He, he's, got, he's got some recompense for you. He said, I will make a great nation. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. Now, if you want to be blessed, be blessed of the Lord. You know, other people bless you for a little while. Then when they get mad with you, they ask you for it back. But when God bless you, you got a blessing. He said, I will make a great nation out of you. And then he said, I will bless you, and I will make your name great, 
Guess what? We're still talking about Abraham to this day. He said, you shall be a blessing. Not only will I bless you and I'll make your name great, but guess what? You'll be able to bless other folk. And it's important, this is just a little, little tidbit on the side, is when God bless us, he don't bless us for us to co consume it all for ourselves, but he bless us that we could be a blessing. And I had to understand that God said uh, to his people in dinner Deuteronomy, he said, I will make you above and not beneath, the head and not the tail, the, the lender and not the borrower. Guess what he mean when he say he gonna make you the lender and not the borrower? You gonna have to lend sometime. Simply mean you're going to have to be a blessing to somebody else. Now that was just a little tidbit on the side. But now God has made all these promises to Abraham, but he hadn't even told him where he's going to go yet. And then he said, I will bless those that bless you. And I will curse, those, curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now brothers and sisters, when God calls us, he don't necessarily, uh, we may not know where we are going, but we serve an omniscient God. So we're going to have to have faith in God. We know that he knows because he knows everything. He knows everything. So back to Philippians chapter 3. He said, but one thing, the Apostle Paul said, one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind me. And reaching toward those things which are ahead. Now the first thing about reaching is you got to forget those things which are behind. We got to be willing to leave those places of familiarity. And leave them in your mind. And remember what happened to Lot's wife. We got to be willing to not even look back on it. But uh, he goes on to say, and uh, as we hasten this broadcast, he said, I press toward the mark of a higher calling in Christ Jesus. Not only do we not look for those things that are behind us, but we gotta press on. There are songs that have been written about, I am pressing on in Jesus. And we have gotta be willing to press on. Yes sir, brothers and sisters, there will be opposition. There will be opposition, but we've gotta press on. I heard when I first got saved a long time ago, people would say, the reason that you're going to have to press on because that, that, that devil which was your best friend has now become your worst enemy when you accepted Christ as your Savior. But it's important to know, brothers and sisters, even when you hadn't accepted Christ as your Savior, the devil was still your worst enemy. He was still your worst enemy. And he's going to be your worst enemy anyway. So you may as well press on in Christ Jesus. So brothers and sisters, uh, no looking back. Uh, forgetting those things behind me. Forgetting those things that are familiar. I spent a lot of times on this broadcast just talking about how we are not willing to move from things that are familiar to us. A lot of times uh, I have uh, not moved in technology. You know, why should I get a new phone when I've just learned how to operate this one right here? Because this became familiar to me now. Even though I don't look at all the other um, the features that the new phone offers. And uh, I think you can identify with what I'm talking about now. Because, well, the same thing with God. He's telling us to move from that place. And oftentimes when God tells us to do things, when he move and ask us to move from one place to the next, it won't make sense. But brothers and sisters, we got to do like he did back, like Jesus did, back in Philippians chapter 2. We got to let this man, chapter 2 starting at verse 5, so let this man be in you which is also in Christ Jesus. Now, when we have to picture Jesus, he was the one that when God said, let there be light, he was the one that put it into action. And he said, let us make men in our own image. What, what us, who you think he was talking to? So I said, let this man be in Jesus, which is also in you. Being in the form of God, did not find it, thought it equal, robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Guess what? Jesus didn't just leave his father's house behind. 
but he left heaven behind. And uh, he said, but made himself of no, uh, thought it not equal, uh, but be a robbery with God, but made it equal. Then he made himself of no reputation. Guess what? He didn't consider what people would say about him when he did it. But taking on the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of man. Now he could have came as an ambassador, a sort of high figure, a royal. But he took on the form of a bond servant. And being then found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. Even the death of the cross. The death of the cross was a shameful death. It was meant to uh, shame. As a matter of fact, if you was a, a Roman citizen, they didn't even crucify you like that. But they did him. And he offered that. He did that for, for the sins. And uh, therefore, God also highly have exalted him. One thing I will say before I move to this verse is that even at that, Christ had to press on in the garden. He asked God, he said, Lord, would you please let this cup pass from me? Then some pressing had to be done. He said, but nevertheless, not my will, but that will be done. So therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and, of the, and those things on the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God our Father. So, brothers and sisters, what I'm here to simply say is that God is calling us to press on. He's calling us to press forward in Christ. So let us not uh, be hindered by things of the past, uh, things of uh, familiarity. Thank you for uh, tuning in to the Where Do We Go From Here broadcast. We don't want to close this broadcast without giving you a chance to accept Christ as your Savior if you do not know him in the pardoning of your sin. For Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 says, If you confess the Lord Jesus with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Let us have a word of prayer. Father, we are... Uh, Thank you for your finished work on Calvary's cross. We repent of our sins and we accept you as our Savior. We believe that if you have uh, said the simple prayer, we believe that you are saved. We invite you to uh, join a Bible-believing church and stay there. And if you don't have a church in mind, please feel free to come and worship with us at the Eureka Missionary Baptist Church. 1595 Lamar Avenue, Memphis, Tennessee, the best church on that side of town. Thank you, and be blessed of the Lord.